Hey everyone, hope you're enjoying the show at Pivot 2021. So excited to be here. I am Colin McClellan. I am the co-founder, CEO of Digital Wildcatters. Give you a little bit of a background on myself. I spent 10 years in the oil and gas industry, drilling and completing wells all over the United States from the deep water Gulf of Mexico, all the way up to the North Slope of Alaska and everything in between. Today, my company, Digital Wildcatters, is focused on media around energy tech. So with that said, I'm super excited about today's conversation and talking about the catalyzing role that venture capital plays in geothermal. Today, we have a super stacked panel for you with some of the top VC firms in the space. So without further ado, let's start making some introductions and get this conversation rolling. First person that we got on the panel today is Alex Helling, CEO of Baseload Capital. Alex, how are you doing? Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Colin. It's a pleasure to, to join this, uh, this panel. And uh, no, I'm good. I'm actually in, in Reykjavik out visiting geothermal sites. And uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Baseload Capital. And we're, uh, we're an inv investment entity, so we're not really a, a VC. So uh, we have raised a lot of VC capital uh, and set the structure where we invest in early stage uh, geothermal projects focused on low and medium temperature enthalpy. Uh, and we're both investing and we're also having our own development companies in uh, Iceland, the US, Japan and Taiwan. So it's a pleasure to join this panel. Awesome. It's great to have you here. Our next panelist is Johanna Wolfson, Principal at Prime Impact Fund. Johanna, it's great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Colin. It's great to be here. So um, as Colin mentioned, I'm with Prime Impact Fund. We're an early stage seed fund investing exclusively in companies that are really big swings at large scale climate impact. And what's probably most unique about us is that we use what we call catalytic capital, um, which is very long term patient impact first capital to support companies at a stage where they might not yet be a fit for conventional investment, uh, but that can really with us prove their value as a company and progress to that next stage. Um, we're really excited about geothermal as an area. We made our first investment in geothermal earlier this year and definitely looking to do more. So looking forward to this conversation. Awesome, we'll have some great conversation or questions for you, I'm sure. Next guest, we have Ann Dewitt, general partner at The Engine. And how are you doing today? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, Colin, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ann DeWitt, as Colin mentioned. I'm a GP at The Engine. The Engine is an early stage venture firm that was built by MIT. We're a startup ourselves. We're about four years old with about 500 million under management. And we're investing in solutions to the world's biggest problems that are being solved by mission driver driven kind of tough tech founders. And certainly the challenge of climate change um, is something that we're deeply uh, interested in as well as um, invested in. We're unusual in the sense uh, that we ourselves have a mission as the engine, and we're also looking for those teams looking to achieve their own missions in solving climate change. Looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Anne. And then last but not least, we have Stuart Coleman, who's actually here in Houston, Texas, along with me, venture principal at the one and only Chevron. Stuart, how are you doing today? Hey, Colin. Um, you know, really appreciate the invite to, to participate on this panel, and uh, I'm glad that you, you're taking on the task to moderate. Um, should be a fun discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And Stuart, I think I saw on your LinkedIn that you're actually a petroleum engineer by trade. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So, uh, I, I got my under, undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi in geological engineering and then went to grad school at uh, UT in petroleum engineering. Um, so obviously kind of a good fit for geothermal given all the you know, subsurface risk that, uh, that we take on developing these, these geothermal assets. But for us in uh, Chevron Tech Ventures, we're, uh, you know, we're kind of the venture capital and innovation arm of Chevron and within that organization, we have two investment teams. There's one that's a, around our future energy fund. They're on their second fund. They just announced that second fund of 300 million earlier this year. Um, you know, and they're focused on things like electrification, autonomous driving, fusion, uh, battery technology, you know, things that are on that five, 10, 15 year horizon, either to enhance or potentially disrupt, um, you know, our business. 
And you would think that, you know, geothermal would fit under their umbrella, but in fact, it, it's, it falls under us on the core venture capital team. So we're kind of the original team. We're on our eighth fund. Um, and, and the reason that geothermal fits with us is because like myself and others on the team, we're, we're petroleum engineers. We've, we've, uh, you know, worked in other parts of Chevron and there's a lot of core competencies that we have in Chevron that are really applicable to geothermal, both from, you know, an investment due diligence standpoint, but also in terms of evaluating the, the scalability uh, of these technologies into our operations. So looking forward Great. to the discussion. Thanks for that. So I want to get this conversation kicked off with, you know, when people think about venture capital, they think about software investments, you know, Uber, Airbnb, Slack. They don't necessarily default to thinking about geothermal. So really, I really want to start this conversation off is kind of getting in the inside of the mind of all of y'all's thesis around geothermal and what got you interested in geothermal or what got your firm interested in geothermal. Johanna, why don't you uh, go ahead and get us kicked off with that and let us know how you guys got started with this. Sure. So we got interested in geothermal because it's a really critical part of meeting our mission in climate. So if we are serious about deep decarbonization, we know that we need, you know, low and zero carbon baseload uh, power and geothermal is one of a handful of solutions, you know, alongside nuclear and renewables plus long duration storage that can really deliver that. Um, so it's kind of on the docket for us to figure out um, and if, if we need to meet, if we want to meet our climate mission. So from a high level, we were interested. Um, then it kind of came to the other part of your question about what would be the right role for us. As you said, um, geothermal is perhaps not a traditional venture fit. You know, there are certainly exceptions and you have some of those gathered on the call here today, but um, all of us as investors who are on this panel have some, you know, kind of unique attribute. And so um, we, as we looked into the geothermal sector, we were interested in understanding what could really be, what were the areas of, you know, particular interest to us. We see, um, you know, companies developing new drilling technologies. We see companies, you know, developing new sensor and exploration technologies. We'd see companies, um, you know, in, um, in um, uh, advanced geothermal, we see closed loop companies. Um, so we kind of did an analysis of all of these opportunities and came to the conclusion that for us as Prime, where we're kind of looking for our um, unique role, you know, we were especially interested in kind of retiring risk during the exploration stage. That was one area that popped up to us um, that is what led to um, an investment in uh, Zanskar earlier this year, which is our first uh, geothermal investment. Um, that company is retiring exploration risk using predictive tools, very exciting. Um, we're also very excited about closed loop um, geothermal and continue to kind of look at, at that. And that's not that the exclusion of other um, geothermal innovations, but those are two areas that um, really emerged as the right fit for us in terms of where we could be uniquely additive um, either because there was maybe, you know, underinvestment in the area or because uh, there, there was a need for our style of catalytic capital. And also want to mention that y'all invested in Lilac Solutions, which is kind of an ancillary product to geothermal. It's a lithium extraction technology that's being used out on geothermal plants. So it seems like y'all have found uh, different wedges into the industry. That's right. And, you know, of course, we're co-invested in Lilac along with the engine um, represented here by Anne. And um, we and uh, the, our investment in Lilac is a good example of that. We also invested um, early on in Quidnet Energy, um, which is not geothermal, but it's, you know, subsurface um, using uh, the subsurface as, as a storage mechanism for energy. So we have kind of been interested in this subsurface area for some time and developed at least some investment side expertise and have, have been excited to, to branch into geothermal. Awesome, thanks for that. And why don't you tell us a little bit about the engine and how y'all got invo involved in geothermal and what y'all see this is? Yeah, I think I'd echo a lot of what uh, Joanna mentioned in terms of you know the options that we have for global scale solutions and the time frame we need them are relatively limited. So I think uh, that's also uh, part of you know, what we see as well in terms of how do we get the, the terawatt conversion if 
you know, just for the US, we're going to convert from kind of carbon heavy. Um, and we, you know, some think we're going to electrify everything. So agree that there's not many options, uh, you know, to really look at carefully. Um, for us, I think uh, very similar. There's, it's, a, it's an approach of how many ways can we go after these solutions that at global scale would work. And I think it's uh, particularly important to figure out how do we use you know, talent and expertise and partnership of companies who really understand deployment at global scale. So I think that's where, um, how can we use what we, all the goodness I'd say that we have in oil and gas that we've developed over, you know, let's call it 125 years. How do we actually use that knowledge um, to, you know, change the way that we think about where we get our energy in, um, you know, from our sources and then how that's deployed, you know, even thinking about can we use heat to heat in geothermal rather than, you know, heat to electricity and potentially back to heat. So for us, um, you know, Lilac Solutions, um, which Joanna mentioned, um, uh, Quidnet team, I think is, is great. I really love Joe, even though uh, we're not an investor. So I like, I like that, that as well. Um, and for ourselves, uh, our investment is in a company called Quaze, which is doing a very deep, supercritical geothermal. Um, and we've put that alongside of um, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, a nuclear fusion focused company alongside grid scale battery storage and form energy. So I think very similar, how do we kind of intersect our, our energy chain, you know, right up front. So we're not finding a bunch of point solutions for all those terawatt hours we're using, you know, in our, in our phones and everything else. Great. And Alex, over at Basel Capital, as you mentioned, you know, y'all aren't traditional VC in this sense. It sounds like y'all are more involved with actually uh, deploying power plants and operating Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, the man himself right now is out visiting geothermal locations as we speak. So he's definitely about that. How did you get into this and what is y'all's thesis at Baseload? I'd say it's a good good question, but now the whole company is based on, on geothermal and the geothermal ecosystem, right? So it all basically started in, in Reykjavik six years ago. And I, uh, I come from a project finance background. I was then uh, working as head of finance for a technology company called Lymon. And uh, what we realized uh, back then was that, you know, with new technologies such as, you know, new technologies in power generation, in uh, drilling space, in, you know, how you uh, do the exploration and all those new technologies can bring geothermal and especially the area we focus on low and medium enthalpy into much more scalable solution so you can you can take you know by investing in this field and you know you can build portfolios of projects instead of single risk projects um, and what is what is needed is actually a lot of capital in order to get this started because it's expensive to build and implement these new technologies so basically uh, when we started the company we wanted to create an investment entity that can support developers locally to utilize new technologies in order to you know foster deploy geothermal power plants uh, but what we also realized along the way is that there are very few players in this field that are actually you know professionally developing uh, low and medium enthalpy geothermal resources in a professional and a global way so that's also when we then said that okay in in some key markets we will also go in and do the development our, ourselves. So it's kind of a, a hybrid where you know we identify new technologies that can speed up the deployment of geothermal power plants in, in all different areas, but then also providing the platform where we can bring in that technology and actually put it to use directly in those uh, in those projects. Um, so so you know it's it's a very interesting field, and I think it's uh, good you know the last couple of, of years the uh, the amount of new companies that are entering the the field that you know come in with the uh, well with, that will bring down the, the capex cost you know how can we utilize closed loop systems how can we you know utilize the drilling technologies in traditional hydrothermal resources in order to build even even better power plants and you know how do we bring the whole industry onto the map like um, I'm, I'm from Sweden, right? So if you ask someone what this renewable energy in, in Sweden, they will say wind and solar. No one will say geothermal, even though, you know, 60% of all the, the households in Sweden actually have heat 
uh, and ground to heat pumps uh, installed, but they don't know that that is, you know, the same system, only that it's heat instead of, of uh, power generation. So I think that not only do we need to focus on, on you know, producing green electricity from geothermal resources, but also, you know, how do we build out the full ecosystem? You know, how do you combine that? Uh, geothermal resource, but you know, connecting that to to district heating, or connecting that to greenhouses, or to to hydrogen production. How can you also utilize the uh, you know the, the idle wells that you have uh, all over the planet today, uh, where you have off grid solutions and how you can build microgrid. So all of these are are things that we look into. But uh, so yeah, we're uh, that's what we do. Great. I'm going to veer off the path here a bit. And Stuart, I'm going to wrap you into this question. We're getting some great questions from the audience. So I'm going to start uh, firing them off at you guys. So this first question that I'm going to ask is, uh, would a climate fund like Prime partner with an oil and gas venture fund like Chevron on geothermal investments? Is there precedent for this in prior geothermal, geothermal deals? And I want to throw out there, Alex, Stuart, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Baseload has a letter of intent with Chevron to build a pilot project on an old uh, Chevron oil and gas well. So let's let's talk about this. Let's get some discussion going. Uh, Johanna, they they called you out on on impact. You know, would y'all would y'all ever partner with Chevron? Let's talk about it. So I love this question. Thanks for asking it. Thanks for going for it. So um, I, I, probably someone else is best uh, positioned to speak to the precedent. I believe the answer is yes, but as as to you know a specific um, transaction, someone else might be better placed, but. You know, the way we think about this at Prime, and we talk about it a lot, is um, we are always trying to find the fastest and most direct path to large scale impact. Like that is our number one priority, full stop. Um, and that could certainly include partnering in some way with an oil and gas company. We would do that if it were the best thing for the company um, to reach scale quickly. I anticipate that in order to reach conviction on that point, we would really want to understand the company's strategy and priorities and how that partnership would unfold. We would certainly ask questions about that, um, but we it is you know we could gain conviction around that as the path to large scale, fast impact, and if so, um, we would be supportive of that. Alex, I see yeah, your hand. I, I can just uh, also add in. I think it's it, it's necessary that we get all the uh, not only Chevron but all the uh, oil and gas players into into this field with all the knowledge that they have. And you know, just as an example, I think 2019 there were 200 uh, geothermal wells drilled in one year. I think the same year uh, it was over 70,000 oil and gas wells drilled. So, you know, just looking at that scale, uh, we need to utilize the knowledge sitting with the, uh, with companies such as, as Chevron and the other players in order to speed up the, the transition for, for geothermal and, you know, in order to uh, bring down the costs and, you know, better understanding the, the subsurface risk uh, and uh, developing these power plants. And uh, something that I, I should have mentioned, because it's kind of in the same topic, but along with our kind of analysis of the path to impact, we would also ask the question, like, what is the risk of the technology being used for oil and gas extraction? And that definitely could vary depending on what type of geothermal innovation it is. So, you know, some geothermal innovations in... Um, um, EGS and exploration are really coming over from the oil and gas space where they are well developed and it's about adapting those for geothermal. Um, there there's kind of not as much of a risk of those being so so called co opted by the oil and gas industry and partnering with an oil and gas company is more likely in the spirit of that oil and gas company developing, you know, an alternate business line versus some new drilling, you know, physics that we might, you know, look at supporting um, that hasn't yet turned to the, been uh, adopted by the oil and gas industry. Those might be at higher risk for what we would call mission, um, you know, off, off going off mission. So that would factor into, I just wanted to mention that. Stuart, how does Chevron uh, look at this, you know, from the other side being at, at the majors, how do they see partnerships with some of these other impact funds and startups in the geothermal space? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I hope the answer is is yes, right? I mean, we're here, you know, we want to be part of the solution. We, we have a lot of expertise that can be, you know, very valuable towards scaling uh, geothermal technology. And, and, you know, not only do we have an LOI with baseload capital, but we're, we're also investors. Um, you know, we, we led the round earlier this year you know, really liked Alex and his team and, and their approach towards the development of geothermal assets. So we're excited to be on that journey. And, and on that journey with us is, you know, Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, they're co-investors with us in Baseload Capital, and I would consider them, you know, very close peers to Prime and the engine with very similar remit. So I think, um, you know, they certainly understand that it, it's going to take you know, a multitude of different types of investors and types of people with different expertise to, to really come together and solve, you know, that next level of, of problems that needs to be solved for geothermal to get from, you know, 0.2% of the energy to even 10% of the energy mix. So, yeah, we hope the answer is yes. Maybe I'll just chime in. Yeah. Um, I, I fully, uh, this is an exciting conversation, but I think it will be very interesting to watch um, what evolves in terms of the management teams of these really exciting innovation companies that are going to be leading for us. I suspect many of them will actually be coming out of oil and gas or the services that support it, such as drilling. And I, I think they're the ones um, who also deeply feel, feel that it, how we are going to do this transition and can do something about it. We already have some executives that are actually out of that. Um, you know, Carlos at Quay's 15 year Slumberger. I know some of the most of most of that team is also sort of out of out of that. I think the the Quidnet team, John, if I remember, is also um, coming with a knowledge a lot of knowledge. So I think the partnership and understanding who's going to be a good partner to achieve. You know, what we're all, I think, trying to achieve for, for sort of the planet um, will be good. It's just who are, who's going to be on the forefront um, of pushing that innovation forward versus kind of, you know, following, following others. So I hope that there'll be many who will want to be at the forefront and really in partnership with these innovative companies as we're trying to figure out what solutions are really going to work for us. Awesome. So we have some more questions rolling in here. And I'm going to kind of combine this one with a question that I had. So when you look at geothermal, it's a high risk business, much like oil and gas was decades ago and still is. But with the shell revolution in oil and gas, you started to de-risk the operations of drilling and completions with the so-called manufacturing process. And once that started happening, you had private equity start rolling in and deploying billions of dollars of capital into the space. Right now, geothermal is still too risky for private equity to come in. So you have this funding gap. And my question is, is venture capital the right fit to fill that gap? And to kind of fuse this with one of uh, the questions from the audience, are you all ready to stay the course for, say, a five to 10 year time frame with your fund? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So let's, let's elaborate um, so, yeah, on that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So I think on the, the, I mean, capitalization, you know, obviously a fun topic for investors. So one, I think there can be the emergence of fund structures that allow for that. So, um, you know, from an engine's perspective, the way the LPs that we have attracted and the way that we're structured is an, an 18 year fund. So very clear when we were raising capital that, um, we could take a longer look at um, foundational companies because they may not all emerge in a five to seven year window, which is, which is a typical structure for a venture fund. So I think um, that, that's something that we'll start seeing, um, I think, the uh, more, more activation around different ways to think about the vehicles that are actually doing the investing. And I'd say we, we're an example of that uh, just at the engine. I think the other um, element that I'm also excited about, and I'm sure others are, are um, you know, the engagement of government. And I think we've seen some programs get fired up pretty quickly. That's going to allow um, not only kind of the SBR uh, sizes and, and maybe some of the original 
and what we have today with some of the you know couple million dollar kind of grants, but something that allows much more uh, capital deployment and in partnership with other funding sources with the government. So I think that that's also going to be important in uh, opening up um, you know some partnerships such as with the national labs in order to go faster and bring together sort of groups that have drilling expertise, for example, they have a geothermal site and government has a piece of technology. So I think um, it's going to take uh, trying to figure out where everyone's going to play, make sure we're able to draw in large capital investors that this is in fact a good investment that you can get a return on. So we're going to need some successes. Um, but I think if we can start getting those pieces in place and understanding kind of who's going to partner with whom and at what stage of the capital stack, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty excited. There's already the, the group here and many others that we've co-invested with that have been mentioned to start building up that that capital stack that we need around these investments. And I'll, I'll jump in with a couple complementary points. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important point that these um, projects aren't really yet considered viable for, for pri private equity or project finance. I will say, I think I mentioned earlier on that part of our investment thesis was around looking for opportunities for risk and cost reduction during resource development. That's in part to make those with, under, with the thesis that that could make geothermal projects in general more financeable. Um, so like I mentioned, that's you know part of why we made the investment that we did. Um, separate to that though, to, to your question, Colin, about is venture the right type of capital? Um, it, it could be you know okay for some early small scale projects. I don't think venture is the right style of capital you know, for um, anything larger, and certainly it's not a long-term plan. Um, and, you know, we do thinking with our, all of our kind of project-based companies about what is that right blend of equity and debt and, and how do you start gaining asset access to debt um, and when, and I, I think to Anne's point, I mean, there are now some funds coming online and some um, even not formal funds, but just capital providers who are a bit more creative in their thinking about um, mixing corporate equity and, and um, access to debt capital um, in interesting ways. And I think that'll be you know, something good to keep watching. And at, at Prime, we're actually um, undergoing an exploration on how do we use catalytic capital? So the same sort of capital that we currently use for venture investing, sourced from philanthropic and other sources, how do we use that to enable first of a kind projects? And that's you know, an effort that will unfold, but it would certainly be relevant to the types of companies we're talking about here. Alex, yeah, if I, yeah, if I can just add on as well, for, for uh, from baseball capital perspective, I think that uh, the support from from uh, VCs and starting up the company have been been vital. So, and and of course, since we both invest and build and operate power plants, we need quite a lot of of capital. So, uh, I think that that uh, what we could do early on was to uh, raise very patient VC capital that wanted to. You know, take part in investing in new technologies and using that new technologies to deploy it to actually prove it. Uh, and I think that the one, uh, what we can see here in Iceland, for example, is that we used those initial funds. We built our first uh, two, three power plants, and then you know, after only one and a half year with technology that was not bankable, we could then refinance that locally with the, uh, with a bank here on, on Iceland. So, you know, I, I would say that that VCs for, for us have been, you know, extremely important to kickstart the whole business model and to start building our, our platform. Then uh, I think that, you know, if we look at the PE side, because we're discussing with the, uh, with the investors in you know, uh, in, in Asia, in Europe, and in the in the US, when it comes to projects that are operational, and when you have the risk, and then you know the uh, finding and identifying money won't be an issue. There are so many uh, investors that looking for those long term cash flows, but it's the way to get there, and I think that that's where you need all the different parts of the, the VCs, everything from you know, micro VCs, when you start up to an idea to VC growth investors, when, when you actually get the a bit business model flying. So uh, I would say that it's, it's, it's needed. Stuart. 
someone from the audience commented that it's a bit ironic that Chevron used to have a great presence in geothermal and had a nice geothermal portfolio divested and now y'all are re-engaging. They wanted to know if you could comment on that. And then my question also is, you know, how do the how does Chevron and the other major oil and gas companies look at investing in geothermal projects? You'd mentioned that uh, y'all had invested in base loads projects. Is this something that's becoming a heavy emphasis internally at the major oil and gas companies? And do you think that that could be a source of, of capital for these um, capital intensive projects? Yeah, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I can't really speak to, you know, our divestment of the geothermal assets. Um, you know, I think that was 2014. I, I was not involved in, in that. But, um, you know, obviously that traditional geothermal has been limited to those areas of the world where, you know, hot rock is close to the surface. It's, it's cheap to drill and the, the, you know, it's very high enthalpy. So um, th that has kind of really restricted the, the growth and potential of geothermal. So in this iteration, if you look at our investments, both in, in baseload and ever that we made this year and, and what we'll look at in the future are things that are going to take it to the next level, right? What are the technologies that are going to enable geothermal to be competitive competitive on a much meaning, more meaningful level within the power markets, right? And that can be things like closed loop, right? That's an emerging technology, still comes with a lot of risk, which I think kind of to the prior question is a good fit for venture capital. Um, you know, Alex spoke about low and medium enthalpy resources. You know, if you can get to lower temperature and still produce power, that opens up a much larger aperture of viable geothermal resources. So if you look at our iteration of, of investments here, they're, they're venture flavored, um, and we're really looking at what the emerging technologies are out there um, to get geothermal to a much more meaningful level within the power markets. Great, thanks. And we have another question here. I'm gonna fuse this with uh, one of my questions also. And the, uh, the question is, one of the main challenges scaling up geothermal is getting first of their kind demonstration projects and power plants funded. So you're looking at between a 20 and $50 million investment. This is the funding valley of death right now for geothermal startups. And this kind of plays into some context that I have from oil and gas tech. These tech startups always struggled with early stage financing. There was just a vacuum of early stage capital. But the one benefit that startups had in oil and gas was that you know, there was a lot of oil and gas activity, like Alex mentioned earlier, just the scale of oil and gas activity compared to geothermal. Um, you just had the distribution there. So if you can manage to raise some capital, develop a product and get a pilot, you had a chance of success. Geothermal doesn't have that benefit of having a lot of geothermal project activity to go and distribute their product to. So these founders face a lot of resistance while trying to get their product to market, even if they do manage to uh, raise capital and develop. So how do y'all's firms think about those types of risk? And do you have any solutions for founders that are trying to bridge that gap? That's a tough question. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I, I, I can start. Go ahead, Alex. No, but uh, so, uh, and, and you know, this is more from a base load capital perspective and, and focused on, on low and medium enthalpy resources. But we speak to a lot of uh, both project developers and uh, founders with, with new technology, especially in the, in the closed loop areas. And I think that, you know, from, from our perspective, it's, it's uh, uh, the difficult part is to validate uh, the technologies because there are also not that. Uh, that good of, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, if you take all the technical consultants, for example, to validate these types of, of new resources where you have to drill, for example, a 4,000 meter uh, well, and then you can do the testing. You know, it's it's uh, a lot of upfront risk that you have to take. So so what we try to, to do when we uh, when we discuss this and look at these projects is to see also, can we find, uh, you know, suitable grants that can take away some of that, that risk to do a pilot project, for example, uh, we have here on, on Iceland, we want to do a combined geothermal uh, greenhouse development. And, and there you have, you know, uh, two technologies that you combine together. But then there's also a lot of grants that can, can you know, support to take the first step and also be the, uh, you know, simplify the investment. 
So I don't know if that's a that's a good answer, but that's how we how we look at it, and you know, try to figure out and support the founders in how can we you know find a viable way uh, of you know not only uh, us investing and and you know supporting in running the project, but can I also you know uh, find other ways of of sourcing that will support the founder to drive the pilot project forward. Uh, this is this is such a complicated uh, topic. Uh, maybe just to take a different angle, I think um, in a in a weird way, the the world is kind of awash in capital right now. Um, everyone's trying to figure out where they're going to put their capital to get a return. Um, you know, so so one, I think that there, it's an interesting moment because you know a lot of public capital, as you've seen, have been moving more private. Um, and the amount of capital that's maintained in sort of the private sector has been has been growing incredibly. So I think that there that capital is there. I, um, I think coming to, you know, education of investors and being able to clearly, you know, describe risk I think is a, a unique uh, skill set among the, the CEOs and founders that are ambitious enough to go after these projects and being able to, you know, again, I'll just sort of take a different approach of, you know, the opportunity here is huge. It's like very rare does like a trillion dollar opportunity kind of come along, right? And so that's kind of what we're looking at. But that's, um, that's a hard story for people to map, you know, kind of wrap their minds around and also to understand uh, what the risk is and what's going to be demonstrated against that risk. It's a, it's a fairly technical field. Um, and if you're trying to get capital from, I'll call it more generalist investors versus very, you know, sort of technical expert early stage folks, um, you've got to kind of describe that in a different way and be able to outline the, the risk and maybe, um, you know, I think a challenge for the CEOs and executive teams and the founders is to figure out are there ways to break apart that risk, to work with partners so that you can move more quickly to showing that you can knock down that risk. So just to take a slightly different uh, angle, I'd say you know, there's a real opportunity to describe the opportunity with geothermal and how do we do a better job of describing the risk, uh, breaking it apart to help more generalist investors understand the, the types of risks and returns that we're looking at with these projects. Yeah, I, I really agree with everything Ann just said. And, um, you know, thinking about, so how do companies traverse this second valley of death, um, kind of the demonstration phase and how do investors get over that too? I think the hard thing about that question is that there really is not a playbook. You know, there is not one discrete way to do that. And that's a hard thing right now. Um, but it's, it is kind of an opportunity because those companies that are able to sort of construct their their set of lily pads to get um, to, to get to get all the way there could be could be very successful, and that could be you know how do you fund those things? It could be some combination of you know state funding and and strategic involvement, you know, off a corporate balance sheet, and you know some kind of special um, more risk taking early debt vehicles could involve companies being more creative with their business model right and do one thing for some time while you partner to get projects together and share revenues off that while you bridge to a different you know until you're in a position to to be an asset owner yourself and so i think that you know that kind of creativity and revenue models will be an important part of companies getting to demonstration as well I would just add to that that you know if you look at getting geothermal to a utility scale, right, where it can compete with with natural gas and and other forms of baseload power that are already out there, there's some wins that can be had along the way, right? I think Alex mentioned it. You know, existing infrastructure where there might be low temperature. Our LOI is in in the San Joaquin Valley where we're doing steam flooding, right? We're already putting significant amount of energy into the subsurface to extract oil and we're producing hot fluid. So we can, we use some technology to lower the carbon intensity of our operations and start to demonstrate some of those technologies bit by bit, right? I think Evers is, is looking at Arctic communities. These are communities that are, you know, isolated from traditional power grids and infrastructure where they have to truck in uh, diesel, 
to essentially power their communities, right? So geothermal can already compete uh, on a uh, on an LCOE basis with with those types of uh, communities and those types of areas. So I think there is, even though drilling a well is expensive and it's a big undertaking and there's a lot of risk, there are some earlier wins that can be had along the way for geothermal to really get to that large utility scale. Great, thanks for that. So we got a question from the audience. They said, this is interesting because we're introducing two different cultures almost and asking them to get married in a funding relationship talking about climate philanthropists and oil and gas teams pursuing geothermal. Any thoughts from the panel about how to bridge this or if this is even a concern in practice? And this plays into a question I had for y'all as well. It sounds like everyone on this panel uh, wants to leverage the technical expertise and experiences from oil and gas, but how do the climate impact funds as a whole feel about the fusion between oil and gas and clean energy such as geothermal? Do y'all see, see it being a problem in the first place? I think there's skepticism, right? I think that um, the history of oil and gas uh, renewables efforts is, a, is an up and down history of um, those coming into favor and falling out of favor. And so I think, um, I would say there's a skepticism that, that doesn't, for us, that doesn't necessarily translate to um, you know, kind of religion one way or the other, as I shared earlier, you know, we would, um, we, we could certainly be supportive of, um, partnerships if we were convinced that that was the path to impact. But I, I think, um, the skepticism is probably warranted. Um, um, but, you know, I think surmountable, um, especially, you know, it, it, these things are often end up being about people, um, and you know, coming around um, together as co-investors around a company that that we really believe in. And once you get to that level, um, and you really understand why does this fit within the the company strategy, uh, the the uh, strategic strategy that is, um, it could make sense. I don't know if we could. Well, at least I am not probably in a position to speak, um, you know, to all climate impact funds. Um, I can share that that's how we would think about it. Um, again, as a case by case basis, um, there certainly are probably funds that um, you know might might stay away from it as a rule, um, maybe more for optics reasons than practical ones. Um, but I, can, I can't. I think um, as um, Alex shared earlier, you know um, there are good examples, um, BED and others, kind of co investing, and I think you know. Uh, good examples of of these um, these worlds colliding beneficially. Great. We have some questions rolling in that are related more to the operations of y'all's funds. So start firing off some of these questions. What is the turnaround time from intro to funding for your entities? Are we talking weeks, months? to make funding decisions, how long is that turnaround time usually in the geothermal startup space? I think it, it, it depends on, um, it, it depends on what that looks like uh, when it walks in the door. Um, just from, from where we are when Car Carlos, who's the CEO of Quays, I'll just do it by example. Um, Carlos was, he was actually the technical director of the engine and Carlos was looking at a set of technologies out of the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center, which um, sort of gave birth to both Commonwealth Fusion as well as Quays. So by the time sort of Quays uh, got started and he met uh, Aaron Mandel and Vinod Kosla and understood what was happening at Alterac, and then they looked at what was happening at the Plasma Science and Fusion Center and thought, hey, there's, there's a new way to think about what the opportunity is in geothermal with this millimeter wave drilling technology. So that was, that was a, um, a long process to identifying from like a technology breakthrough standpoint. Um, and that academic body of work had you know, been going on for, for a decade behind that. At the point when you know, the company had actually been formed and then started talking about what was the right way to really capitalize that company those, those discussions could move relatively quickly, I'd say in part because we understood, because Carlos was, was one of us uh, at the engine, we understood how he made decisions, how he was gonna think about team building. We understood who the first set of you know, 
what the founders were going to look like and what their orientation was to building the company. So, you know, that can be a relatively fast process if it's a highly technical um, underwriting. You know, for us, we do uh, that technical diligence because we invest in sort of breakthrough academic institutional research. So that takes, uh, it, you know, typically takes, uh, you know, four to six weeks, can take longer depending on the complexity of the technology. Um, but, you know, also if we need to see if there are new founders that we've just met, really understanding that founding team, why are they doing what they're doing? How do they make decisions together and how do they learn together? It's all we know with innovation is that you're gonna be learning together. You know, that can take, that can take time to watch the team and engage and understand how they make decisions. So there's no one answer. Uh, we've had things go really short um, you know, two or three months. And then we've also had, we've known teams for two to three years inside of academia before they're actually ready to, to come out and finance as a company. Yeah, very, very similar with us. Um, can be on the order of um, a couple of months um, if you know things things move quickly um, from from beginning to end, from first meeting to end. Um, but we do love to meet teams really early. Um, so you know if there's a um, if there's a you know a group out of the university you know working in the incubator you know in, in Jamie's program that she runs, um, we want to we would love to meet them early and just you know have an informal relationship and give advice. And that might mean we know them for years um, before before. Um, there's even an investment to talk about. So there's quite a range. Great, and the next question we have is, how much investment do you see coming in the next uh, several years in geothermal, whether it's VC, private equity, oil and gas firms? This person said, let's hear some firm numbers. What are you, what are you thinking in terms of firm numbers for investment in the geothermal, let's say over the next five to 10 years? That's like we can give a guess. We won't hold. We won't hold. Hold you to it. Yeah, that's like <laughs> that include like SPACs and IPOs or. Yeah, I, I think with the SPAC craze, you have to include SPACs. Well, I, I would say it, it's very hard to give a uh, give a, uh, a fixed number to that. But what what we can see and or what at least we can see from from Basel Capital, you know, from when we started the company just four years ago. Uh, to where we are today and the, the interest that we have you know both from from Asian investors European investors and and uh, American investors have grown rapidly from you know when when initiating discussions four years ago no one knew what what geothermal was when and and now they actually have a program to focus and and you know want to invest in in geothermal and understand it so I think that there will be a, a huge movement and a huge capital movement into into geothermal uh, but then you know how big that that will be uh, I can't answer that that was a good answer Alex I think that'll uh, I think that'll suffice I think the the rest of the panel will let you go out on the limb and uh, answer that one so and we got a question specifically for you someone wants to know when will we get an engine in Houston <laughs> Wow, you know, I would I would love to just talk about uh, Houston and and with if there's any more questions or comments or insights for me, um, I, I think may, maybe people don't know, but I'm I'm actually a, a, a Houston fan um, in part because I um, I've got a, a couple of teams, Joanna obviously Quidnet team, but uh, we have the Syzygy Plasmonics team and Quays, and I have just been at meeting um, the ecosystem in Houston. I am so excited about the potential of what that city is going to do. I mean, the star of the world, right, of oil and gas. And I think the, the commitment of that city to really figuring out like how to transition, I find very, very exciting. Um, so um, again, an engine in Houston, I don't know. There's a lot of goodness in Houston. Would I be happy to invest in amazing founders that are putting their company in Houston? Absolutely. But I don't, I don't know if Houston needs an engine. There's a lot of, there's a it lot sounds, of goodness there already, but. It sounds like there's a chance. So we'll, we'll hold out hope for that happening. So we have a good question. Greentown Labs, Houston. I mean, there's a lot of goodness <laughs> there already, so. Absolutely. 
We have a good question here that I think will be really insightful for founders and builders in the audience that are listening to this discussion. They ask, can you give some examples of risk which you, you have identified and resulted in you not investing in geothermal projects that would help the industry to get feedback on where to target improvements to access capital? I can start on that one. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's a big surprise to the group that when I say, you know, drilling risk is the biggest thing. Um, you know, we, we talked about kind of the unconventional growth around, you know, the technology, the horizontal drilling, all of that that came together for unconventionals, um, you know, we were able to do that from a manufacturing standpoint, repeatable um, and, and really minimizing the risk that's associated with that. So I think it's the same thing with geothermal. There's not really any specific reason that we would, you know, say no, but I think that's kind of the big elephant in the room from a risk standpoint is just drilling costs. And, and reservoir uncertainty, right? So those are the two that we're comfortable with um, as a company, but as a startup that may be cash strapped, right? You're taking on a lot of risk. There's a low margin for error on the execution of those. And so when we evaluate, you know, these geothermal companies, geothermal projects, that, that's a key thing that we're honing in on is, you know, what is the reservoir risk? What is the drilling risk? And how does that impact to, to cost and execution risk? So. Yeah, and, and from uh, from our perspective, since we invest in in uh, projects and and local developers, I would say that the the main part when looking in in different markets is uh, you know the uh, risk of uh, uh, corruption, for example, or that you don't have the right structures in in place. And I think that that's uh, uh, the main reason why we turn down uh, projects in in certain markets. So, um, you know, we tend to be very embracing of, of risk, especially technology risk. That's kind of um, our jam. Um, but um, so a, a couple maybe uh, uh, orthogonal ways that we might, you know, uh, think about risk that we would not pursue. One might be, one could be downstream financing risk, which we've touched on a bit. Um, so we are a, we're a kind of an early catalytic fund. If we don't see a pathway for a company um, to sufficiently retire enough risk to then get downstream capital, you know, that would give us pause. Um, I can't think of any particular examples where that's happened, but it certainly could. Um, another one that has come up, um, I don't know if it answers the question exactly, but another a, a geothermal area that we've looked at would be kind of specifically sensors, you know, kind of advanced sensing, downhole sensing, that kind of thing, where, you know, the um, technology might be good, might be solving a problem, but we have trouble seeing it kind of as a venture investing opportunity. I guess you could, you know, think about that as returns risk, but not, but more on the, the size um, rather than the likelihood. So um, that's another kind of category that comes to mind when I hear the question. Maybe I'll chime in on the last one that was alluded to, but I'm going to just hammer on founding team um, and just understanding or, or executive team really understanding like, how does that team work together? How do they make decisions? Like, how, do they have a true north? Um, do they have sort of a value set that's like that they're uh, building down through the organization? So I that would be just one addition I would I would add on, but agree with all those points. But really that founding team, do do they really have a mission to build the company that they're gonna build? Because it's it's ambitious to build companies like what we're talking about, um, which is awesome. Um, but having the right ones to go down that path with with you and um, as a founding team, I think is is super important. Awesome. So I'm sure that we could talk about geothermal for another one to two hours if we wanted to, but unfortunately we are running out of time. So we got to wrap this up real quick. Everyone, you have one minute to give your closing statement. If you don't have a closing statement, tell me what you're excited about in geothermal. Tell, tell everyone, you know, what gets you out of bed in the morning and gets you going. Johanna, we'll start with you. You got one minute. You're on the hot seat. Okay. Well, um, what gets me excited, you know, I didn't get much of a chance to talk about, um, I, but I mentioned um, our early investment in um, Zanskar Geothermal. And I think what I'm so excited about with that is we do think a lot about very, very future geothermal. 
um, in terms of you know what could um, enhanced geothermal bring us, what could closed loop drilling bring us, um, and that's exciting. But what's almost more exciting to me is sort of the the really low hanging fruit on what's already underneath our feet. Um, what you know what the blind resources are that we're not um, we're we're not accessing because exploration hasn't we haven't had the exploration tools. I'm super excited about that. And then secondarily, I'm just really excited about some of the off taker movement we're seeing. I mean, the California Public Utilities Commission um, did a huge procurement announcement that I think is going to be pretty game changing for the geothermal world. So um, exciting to watch, excited to watch what happens there. Awesome. Thank you. And it's your turn. Uh, yeah, it's it's about like the, the founders. So, so any sort of wicked smart founder or founding team that's just got some crazy ambition to solve the world's biggest problems. And that's going to run through brick walls and learn whatever they got to learn to do it. Um, every day that will get me out of work and I will work for that founding team. So um, that one's, that one's easy for me. That's hands down why, uh, why I do what I do. And I want to do everything I can to support those founders and building their companies. That's great. Thanks, Anne. Alex. Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I love this. Uh, this work what we're what we're doing and i i love the, the movement that we see in the the industry with all the new companies coming and you know us building a, a platform for how we can deploy new technologies and actually you know when when we have finished a, a project and put the power plant online knowing that you know developed correctly that power plant will be there forever producing green based on power i just think that's that's amazing. And, uh, you know, finding ways on how we can, can scale that up to what Stuart said, utility scale, I think that uh, you, that journey have, have just begun. And, uh, you know, it will be extremely exciting to see what, the, uh, what we, together with the rest of the industry and all the new players can, uh, can do over the, uh, the next decades. It's awesome. Excited to see what you're working on, Alex. Stuart. Yeah, I think last, you know, last this, but not least, man. What do you got? Yeah, I, I think you know th this is fun. You know, this is a very uh, emerging area for folks that have a you know strong background in, in subsurface engineering. You know, lots of smart people really trying to tackle this. Uh, you know, it's exciting to be able to meet those folks, talk with them, learn what they're really grinding on, and uh, you know, this it's it's exciting because as a you know petroleum engineer, this is. This is a big problem um, that that's uh, you know pretty exciting to tackle. It's like opening a new puzzle box and really figuring out, right? We got the frame. We kind of know how to do geothermal uh, where it's easier, but how do we get those inner pieces uh, locked together and really get this to a point where you know we're providing utility scale with subsurface heat? You know that's that's an exciting problem to try and solve. Awesome. Well, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this panel. I want to thank all of these panelists for coming on. I mean, just rock stars and this conversation is exciting. You know, it's exciting to see that the times that we're in and see the change that's happening and, you know, just really seeing the evolution of the technology and geothermal. So thanks all the panelists. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you doing this to Pivot 2021 team. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure doing this. If y'all haven't downloaded the Collide app yet, it's been mentioned in the show previously, just search Digital Wildcatters in the App Store, get on the Collide app, get in the geothermal group, and let's keep the conversations going. We'll catch y'all next year. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, guys. Yeah.